I'm so pleased to welcome you all here this morning for our time of worship. May God meet with us and bless us each one as we bow our hearts before him. And now let's come to him in prayer. Let us all pray. Kind and ever gracious Lord God, our loving Father, we would humble ourselves in thy most awesome presence. We would bow before thee as the one true and living God. As we come to thee, we pray, Lord God, that thou would be gracious to us and bless us. O oh Lord, warm our hearts with the true love for thee. Open our hearts to the reality of spiritual things. Draw us close to thyself at this time, that the things of thy word might feel very real and very near, that we might truly seek first the kingdom of God. Bless us now, we pray, for we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn for our first hymn this morning to number 25 in the Blue Young People's Hymn Book. Number 25, Come Every Thankful Heart That Loves the Saviour's Name. Number 25. So pleased that we can come now to our Bible reading, returning back to the book in the Old Testament which we've been looking at in our Sunday School lessons in recent weeks, to the book of the prophet Jonah. It's one of the small Old Testament books. If you have one of the Red Presentation Bibles, you'll find this reading on page 917 in the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Jonah. And we're going to read from chapter 1, verse 17, which is the final verse of chapter 1 and then down into chapter 2. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow up Jonah and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord his God out of the fish's belly and said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord 
and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice, for thou hadst cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about, all thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul, the depths closed me round about, the weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains, the earth with its baths was about me for ever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came in unto thee into thine holy temple. They that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, but I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. And the Lord spake unto the fish, and it vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Well, may God truly bless to each one of us that portion of his holy word and bless us as we consider it in a few moments. But now let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's all pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, our gracious, loving Father, we would come to thee in the name of thy dear Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. O Lord, as we bow before thee, we marvel at thy amazing character. O Lord, we praise Thee, that Thou art the one who truly is God, supreme, majestic, reigning over all, the eternal God, utterly secure upon the throne of heaven, the one who rules over everything, the one upon whom everything else depends. And yet, O Lord God, as we bear before Thee in Thy matchless greatness, we come to adore thee, to worship thee, that thou art a God of tenderness, of love, of compassion, of kindness. O oh Lord God, we thank thee that thou art a God who looks upon us with great mercy. O oh Lord God, although we are utterly undeserving, we thank thee for thy long suffering towards us in the face of our sin our rebellion, our iniquity. Thou art a God who has showered upon our lives so much. O oh Lord God, we have such bounty from thy hands. O oh Lord, we thank thee for life itself. We praise thee for preserving us to this very moment. We thank thee, Lord, for giving us the great, awesome privilege of being made in thy image, that we, in some small yet very real measure, might reflect the God who made us. We thank thee, Lord God, that thou hast made us with a never-dying soul, made us truly to relate to thee, the God of heaven and earth. And yet we thank thee, Lord God, that in the face of our sin, thou hast not, have not just been a God of long-suffering, merely holding back thy wrath. But we thank thee that in the gospel there is pardon, there is cleansing for our sin. There is a removal for, of all our guilt for each and every one who truly repents and trusts in Jesus Christ. Bless us, we pray. We pray that not one of us might be lost. We pray, Lord, that the seriousness of spiritual things would not be lost upon us, that rather we might earnestly, wholeheartedly seek the Saviour. We pray, Lord God, that even this day, even this morning, might be the hour for one or another soul who has never come to the Saviour, that this might be the day, the hour, when they might come to Jesus Christ. Bless us, we pray. We thank thee, Lord God, that when the Lord Jesus Christ was upon the earth, he had time for 
each and every group of people. We thank thee, Lord, that he did not despise anyone. We thank thee that he had time for the youngest, the poorest, those who are despised and hated by others. We thank thee, Lord, for those that he, the Lord Jesus Christ loved, those who were diseased and outcast. And we praise thee that the Lord Jesus Christ with great joy welcomed them to him, that he might receive them and cleanse them and pardon them and restore them. Most of all, to restore them to God, that they might have a living, true relationship with God in Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we pray that might be the experience of each and every one of us. And Lord, as we come to thee, we pray that thou bless us each. We thank thee, Lord, thou art God who does care. Help us in all our earthly needs to commit them to God in prayer. We thank thee, Lord, for those who have had answers to prayer over the past week. We pray, Lord God, for those who may be going through continuing difficult times of stress and heartache, who may be mourning and grieved. Lord, be close to those. Help each one of us in our time of need to look to God in prayer. Oh Lord, help us not to turn to despair or turn just to our own resources, but to rely hard upon Thee. Bless us each one, we pray. We pray, Lord God, for uh, those we love, those who may be far from us. We pray, Lord God, for those who we may have who pray, may have brought to Thee many times in prayer, that they would draw them to Thyself and save them. We pray, Lord God, that they would help us and meet with us now. Bless our times when we consider Thy words. Help those who teach the young. Help us each to listen. We pray, Lord God, that Thou would give us a teachable spirit. Soften our hard hearts. Open our spiritual eyes. Unstop our ears. And we pray, Lord God, that the things of God might be made a blessing to each and every one. May the kingdom of God be built even this day, built in our lives that we might advance in the things of God and might be built wherever the gospel of Jesus Christ is set forth. Bless us at this time we pray. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to our next hymn which is number 23. Number 23, Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth his successive journeys run. Number 23.
today's talk is about self-control. Being a wise person means being somebody who's able to control themselves, being able to hold, your, being able to handle your emotions and your behaviours is very important in life. You know, if you have an electronic gadget, that it's really important for it to work fun properly. If it malfunctions, that causes you a lot of problems. We also need to be able to control ourselves so that we function appropriately. That is, in a way that is pleasing to God. So today's talk is about self-control. I hope you are self-controlled. Self-control is the ability to say no to wrong desires and yes to what God wants. Being self-controlled brings much peace and happiness to your life. Imagine a parent asks a child to be in bed by nine o'clock. If the child is self-controlled, they can quietly take, them up, up, take themselves up to bed and get ready quietly and go to bed at the set time. That is one way to be self-controlled and that can be repeated on all different things that we need to do every day. A young person who can organise themselves be self-controlled has a big advantage in many areas of life. Everyone needs to be able to be self-controlled. Here we've got a picture of a child who's maybe been asked not to eat the cake. But will they be able to manage that? Will they be able to be self-controlled? The Bible commands us to be self-controlled. Self-control leads to a happy and blessed life. As a young person, if you control yourself and stick to the boundaries that are in the Bible and the boundaries that your parents give, and you become self-controlled yourself, you'll be much happier than if people have to keep reminding you of those boundaries. I expect you can all think of times when you've seen a child behave, like in this picture, in a very uncontrolled way. It's incredibly sad to see a child behave like this. It shows that they haven't managed to control themselves. You may not realise that every day there are on the news there are lots of cases of adults who haven't managed to control themselves and this has led to them leading a life which causes them great sadness. Maybe you can think of a time when you've been not as controlled as you should have been. And that's very sad. Do you know, any skill you learn has to be practiced. Maybe you're good at football, then you have to practice football skills. Maybe you're good at cooking, then you have to practice cooking or good at writing or drawing. You have to practice those things that you're good at. And when you learn to be self-controlled, you have to keep practicing. To learn a new skill, you have to keep persevering. And with self-control, you need the Lord's help and keep persevering to gain that control that you need. And the Lord will help us if we ask him and confess our sins for when we haven't done it. Self-control is like a fence that protects you. If you have a garden, I expect there is a fence to protect you. And self-control is like a fence round about you to help to stop you doing things that are wrong. When the Bible says that somebody who lacks self-control is like a city with broken down walls. A city with the walls broken down will be destroyed. And if we are unable to control ourselves, if we lack self-control, we will end up very damaged. Someone who lacks self-control is like a city with broken down walls in great danger. Christians should all have self-control. It is a sign that somebody is a Christian if they are self-controlled. The Bible tells us about the fruits that Christians should have to show that they are a Christian. If you plant an apple tree, you get apples. If somebody is a Christian, there are fruits that people should see in their lives. The fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, self-control or temperance our bible sometimes say it means the same thing self-control we should be self-controlled in our lives just as you expect grapes to grow on a vine you expect self-control in somebody who is a christian there are many examples in the bible of different people who showed self-control jesus of course is the best example jesus showed great self-control through his life in all different situations when people were unkind to him, he always turned the other cheek. He was always a peacemaker. He always tried to be kind to other people. But Jesus showed great self-control when he was tempted in the desert. Look at this picture. It looks like stones, but they're actually bread, a bit like pita bread. 
When Jesus was in the desert, one day he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And the devil came to him, tempted him to change one of the stones in the desert to bread. And Jesus must have been so hungry. And he could have so easily done that. But it wouldn't be right because that miracle would have been just to please himself. And so he didn't do that. And yet, that showed what great self-control the Lord Jesus Christ had. He was tempted to change those stones to bread, but he resisted that temptation because he had great self-control. Someone else in the Bible who has great self-control is King David. David wasn't king at the time, but David showed great self-control when he spared the life of his enemy, King Saul. King Saul had been very unkind to David. Many a time King Saul had tried to take David's life. David had had to run away from him. And then one day there was an opportunity for David to kill King Saul. And his friends said to him, go on, here's the opportunity, kill King Saul. But David said, how can I do such a wicked thing and kill King Saul? What he did was took a tiny bit off the bottom of his clothes and showed it to him to show him how close he was and how much self-control he'd exercised in not killing his enemy. So David was very self-controlled. Someone else in the Bible who we read is very self-controlled is Joseph. Remember Joseph who had that multicolored coat? He was very self-controlled throughout his life. You think about when his brothers were unkind to him. We don't read that he retaliated. Think about when he was in Potiphar's house. He behaved himself very, very, very well. He was very controlled. And sadly, people mistreated him. And when he was mistreated, he even then was self-controlled. When he was thrown into prison, he controlled himself and worked hard, was responsible. Many different times during his life, even later on, when he met his brothers again. He wasn't cruel to them. He exerted great self-control and was kind to them. In the Bible, there are many examples of people who show self-control, but there also are some examples of people who didn't always show self-control. Peter, the apostle, that great fisherman, who sometimes followed Christ with all his heart. At other times, he lacked self-control, didn't he? Like when he denied the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have other accounts of times when he made bad mistakes and he wasn't so self-controlled. But you know, whenever he wasn't self-controlled, he regretted it. And he repented, he was truly sorry. And Peter went on to say how important it was to be self-controlled. In his epistle, in the letter that he wrote towards the end of his life, he said how important it is to become self-controlled, how important it is to follow after Christ. And if we've realized that we haven't always been as self-controlled as we should be, we need to ask the Lord God to forgive us, to forgive us for when we haven't had that self-control, when we've said or done things without thinking. I need to ask the Lord to forgive us and to help us this week to become more self-controlled. So I want you to remember that a wise person is a self-controlled person. God wants us to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He wants us to confess our sins and to be like the Lord Jesus Christ and to be self-controlled. Remember though, we can only become self-controlled with God's help and by practicing. Practicing to do what's right and good. So I ask the Lord to help you this week to be self-controlled. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk. And of course, in a moment, we come to our Sunday School lesson from the book of the prophet Jonah. We look forward to that lesson and pray that God will bless it to each one of us. I would, of course, Remind you that we meet this evening at Repton Connect. It's great to see each one who meets with us on that occasion. I would encourage as many as possible to gather with us Sunday evening if you are able. And of course, I remind you as well that in a few weeks' time, we will start again our morning worship back at the school in September at the usual time of 9.30. But now let's turn to our next hymn, following which we have the Sunday School lesson. Uh, next hymn is number nine, God Who Made the Earth the air, the sky, the sea. Number nine.
Now over the summer we are learning about Jonah. Jonah was a prophet of the Lord God who loved the Lord God and yet he didn't always get things right and we're learning about a particular incidents, incident in Jonah's life when he didn't get things right. You can read about Jonah in your Bible. There's a book in your Bible it's called the book of Jonah. It's very short, literally it's just three pages in my Bible. So those of you who are at junior school or older, you definitely should be able to read the whole of the book of Jonah. If you want to find it in your Bible, Jonah comes a little way before the New Testament. In my Bible, it's about 40 pages before the New Testament starts. If you just flip over a few pages, you will find there's the New Testament, which is a little way back. My uh, encouragement to you is to read the whole of the book of Jonah because it's not very long at all. So two weeks ago we started and we learned about the fact that God had a message for Jonah. It was this, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it. Nineveh was the superpower. In fact, Nineveh was in charge and conquered the land of Israel where Jonah lived. And they were the people who had got all the development, all the technology, everything. But God noticed that also their wickedness and their sin had come to God's notice and attention. God knows what we do and how we behave. He cares about how we behave. He's not neutral. He knows what we do. And God said to Jonah, you must go to Nineveh, but Jonah disobeyed. And one of the things we learned was that we must obey the Lord God. We must obey the Lord God. And we found out last week, one of the consequences for Jonah was that that ship that he went on, there was a big storm and he knew it had come about because he'd not obeyed the Lord God. That trouble came because he had not followed God's instruction, he'd gone in the opposite direction, not gone to Nineveh, he'd gone or tried to go to Tarshish and he said to the sailors, throw me overboard. The sailors were terrified about doing that. They knew he would die if he went in the sea. We know the sea can be dangerous. We live in an island, the sea is all around us. Every summer, including this summer, we get notices, things on the news saying be careful when you go to the seaside. Even if it's sunny and the sea is calm, the sea can be dangerous. Think how much more dangerous, therefore, the sea is in the middle of a storm when you're in the middle of the sea. If you go overboard, you can't read many accounts of many people where that's happened. And the reason is because they die very quickly. Um, accounts tell us often that the water is so cold, people can't live more than a minute or a couple of minutes and, and they sadly die. So you can't read many, many accounts of people who survived going into the sea at any point, even in the calm. Um, the sea is a dangerous place. But Jonah was thrown overboard and immediately it became calm. Those sailors were affected by that. And we learn that God is in control. Because God knew exactly where Jonah was. And God knew and cared for Jonah. And God sent a large fish. And the fish swallowed Jonah. Jonah didn't die. That was amazing. That is God's kindness. In the middle of disaster, in the middle of trouble... God kept Jonah safe. Isn't that a lesson for us this year in 2020? With the COVID-19, that danger, that fear of the unknown, we need to remember that God is in control and God cares and God provides for us even though things may seem very difficult. Jonah gives us an example of what we need to do in those difficult times when it all seems very dark. I expect when Jonah sort of came to and he realised I'm in the middle of a fish, 
fish would be very dark inside and if you would have thought cool there's all that water on the outside he realized that God had saved him he realized that God had not allowed him to die and he did what we need to do and he prayed to the Lord God and that's when you need to read the book of Jonah read about the prayer of Jonah but he started off in my distress I called to the Lord he prayed and we need to pray to the Lord God in our distress and at all times and God will hear us if we truly come to him and pray to him in the right way sometimes we say to ourselves well I know I should pray but what should I pray about well Jonah gives us an example of what we should pray and how we should pray well, Jonah talked about the fact that he had gone into the sea. He said, you hurled me into the deep, the sea. No, God hadn't hurled him into the sea. The sailors did that. But Jonah knew that all our circumstances in our life are overruled by God. God brings about the good times and the hard times. And they're all in God's control. And they're all there for a purpose and you can see Jonah's description as I said we don't many descriptions of people who've been into the sea but he talks about so to the very deep he went down deep in the water it must have been scary he must have thought I'm going to die it says the current swirled about me and all the waves and the breakers swept over me the water was above his head you may have had that experience being in the water maybe you've been to the seaside and the waves have come over your head it's a scary experience it's not a good time a good thing to experience and Jonah spoke about that in his prayer to the Lord God he talked about the seaweed was wrapped around my head can you imagine that all over the place and he felt as he was going right down down deep he was sinking he was going to die but he didn't die because God kept him safe and it made Jonah think. It made him realise that because he loved the Lord God and trusted the Lord God, he could pray to Lord God to keep him safe. And God heard him. And it made him reflect that those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Idols can't save us. Grace is God's mercy and love to us in saving us when we don't deserve it Jonah knew he didn't deserve to be saved he knew he disobeyed the Lord God and yet the Lord God had been very very kind to him the Lord God had saved him and rescued him and he knew he could pray that to the Lord God and Jonah also said something that's very important that we all need to realize we can't get right with God by being good or trying to reform ourselves in fact we can't get right with God by any other way than the way that he has made and he tells us what that way is it says salvation is from the Lord the only way we can get right with God is through the Lord Jesus Christ and what the Lord Jesus Christ did when he died on the cross. We can't be good enough for God. We can't save ourselves. We need to be saved. Jonah couldn't save himself from the sea. He was in a desperate situation. And that's a picture of what we are like without God. We can't rescue ourselves. We are like sinking in the water. If we try and organise our lives, we try to be on top of our lives, we try to manage our lives, we're as best as sinking in the deep. We need someone to rescue us. We are grateful in this life for people like the lifeboat people who rescue people from the sea. But the rescue the Lord God does of souls is far, far greater, far more immense, far deeper, far more powerful than anything that any lifeboat person can do and what they do is often amazing and Jonah knew if God had allowed him to live 
God had got a purpose in his life. And when difficult things happen to us, maybe difficult times happen, they happen for purpose. And Jonah knew they'd been kept alive for a purpose. And he prayed to Lord God and he said, I know that you are the true God. And the Lord God spoke to the fish and the fish vomited Jonah up on to the shore. Now, we don't know where that was, but we do know that God had something to say to Jonah when he landed on the shore. It was this. It's the same message. Jonah, you've got to go to Nineveh and preach. Jonah didn't need to be told twice now. He had had that experience right in the depths of the water. He knew totally that God is in control. He knew that we can't disobey the Lord God because the Lord God is overall and he sees us and he knows everything we do. And Jonah knew that he had to go over the land to that great city of Nineveh and preach to the people who were there. Thank you, of course, for that lesson. We turn now to our next hymn, following which we have an address from the Bible, from the book of the Gospel of Luke. But we turn now to 153. My faith looks up to thee, thou Lamb of Calvary, Saviour divine. 153. encourage you to take your Bibles and turn again with me to the Gospel of Luke. Gospel of Luke chapter 7. If you have one of the Red Presentation Bibles, you'll find our reading on page 74 in the New Testament. As you are all aware, we've been looking at the early ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, particularly in the region of Galilee. And we have looked particularly at some lessons from the Gospel of Luke. And we're going to continue this in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, commencing to read at verse 11. And it came to pass the day after that he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, went into a city called Nain, and many of his disciples went with him, and much people. And when he came nigh to the gate of the city, behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And much people of the city was with her. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her and said unto her, Weep not. And he came and touched the bier. And they that bare him stood still. And he said, Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. And he that was dead sat up and began to speak. And he delivered him to his mother. And there came a great fear on all, and they glorified God, saying that a great prophet is risen up among us, and that God hath visited his people. 
And this rumour of him went forth throughout all Judea and throughout all the region round about. And the disciples of John showed him of all these things. And John, calling unto him two of his disciples, sent them to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? When the men were come unto him, they said, John Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come, or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues, and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, to the poor, the gospel is preached, and blessed is he, whosoever shall not be offended in me. We have been looking at the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we have another couple of incidents, significant incidents from the Lord's life in this passage that we have just read. But we're going to start by looking at those final words that we find in verse 23, where the Lord Jesus Christ says these striking words, Blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. These words should be a challenge to each and every one of us. Does the Lord Jesus Christ attract you or offend you? Do you find what the Lord Jesus Christ said and what he stood for, something which you feel uncomfortable with, rather embarrassing, or do you embrace him and identify with him are you someone who will receive him or hold him at arm's length? Now the Lord Jesus Christ says to us very clearly in these words that if we're one who receive the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're not offended, if rather we embrace him, his person, his teaching, all that he stands for, then we are truly blessed. This is an unmistakably clear statement to encourage us this morning. But when the Lord Jesus Christ said these words, he had someone particularly in his mind's eye as he said these words. The Lord Jesus Christ was speaking particularly to some messengers who came to him from a man we know as John the Baptist. You probably know that John the Baptist was the great herald of Jesus Christ. He was sent by God immediately before the Lord Jesus to prepare the Jewish nation for the coming of the Messiah. And John the Baptist was a godly man. In this passage, in a few verses on from where we left off the reading in verse 28, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks so highly of John the Baptist. He says in verse 28, There is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. Yes, John was a most exceptionally godly individual and at this time he was willing to suffer for his faith. But although he's such a godly man, the Lord Jesus Christ knew that he needed to hear this clear, unequivocal statement from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ that John must not be offended by the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, when the Lord Jesus Christ said this statement, he particularly was thinking of it applying to John the Baptist. But the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ says this word, he makes it clear that it applies to each and every one of us. He says, whosoever shall not be offended will be blessed. And in contrast to John, John who is so exceptionally committed to the Lord, we are so spiritually weak and often so sinful and worldly. And if this godly man, John the Baptist, needs to be warned, that he gently warned, warned, of course, that he should not be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we most certainly need to hear 
this clear statement from the lips of the Saviour. But why did John need to hear this at this time? Now, when the Lord Jesus Christ spoke these words, John had been arrested. He was in prison, not because he'd done anything wrong, quite the contrary. He was in prison, suffering, isolated and lonely for standing up for that which was right. And the, John was now in prison and that imprisonment would eventually end in his execution, in his death. But John had been the one who announced that the Messiah, the Christ, was coming. And all that John said about this coming one, who was the Lord Jesus, was absolutely true. John was a prophet of God and he spoke the word of God. But, like many prophets in the Bible, they spoke what God gave them to say. But they didn't always fully understand the full implications of what God had given them to say. And like many of the Jews of his age, John probably thought that the one who is going to come would come in visible, earthly greatness and bring great visible victory to his nation. But then the Lord Jesus Christ appears on the scene. And how does he come? As a king? No, but as a humble preacher. I expect that that must have gradually shocked John, that the one he had announced and pointed to was going about simply as a preacher. Yes, John had spoken of the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ who was coming. He said words like this, the axe is laid to the root of the tree and every tree that does not bring forth good fruit shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. The trees that do not bear fruit will be destroyed in that way, speaking of those who do not bring good, forth good fruit to God. He spoke of the Christ who would come, would be one who baptises with the Holy Spirit, yes, but also baptise with fire. He would gather the wheat into his barn or his garner, but he would burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And yet, these words speak on the one hand of greatness, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ comes so gently, so calmly, not as a great visible uh, earthly king or victor, as some might have imagined. And perhaps we might be tempted in the same way to doubt Jesus Christ. We might be tempted to question that he is truly the great one of whom the Bible speaks. After all, we might think, why isn't everyone a Christian? In fact, true faith is in a minority and many people despise the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God and the Gospel. Outwardly, it might seem that the Gospel is not triumphing. And then John might also wonder this, why am I locked up in prison if the Lord Jesus is truly the Christ? Why doesn't he do something about my difficulties? Here I am suffering completely unjustly and my suffering just does not make sense. And maybe we at times face things we don't understand and we cannot make sense of. And maybe our suffering is something that makes us be tempt, to be tempted to doubt the Word of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. But even if we do not fully understand, John and us need to hear the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed is he that shall not be offended in me. We need to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to trust that he's working out everything perfectly. Perfectly even in our lives. Our lives are in his hands. And although we may not be able to understand everything, he has it fully in his control. And we need to believe that the Lord Jesus Christ truly is the great one sent from God. Even if many at this stage do not believe upon him. What John said of the Lord Jesus Christ being truly great is absolutely true, but John didn't see that the Lord Jesus Christ 
we didn't appreciate at first that the Lord Jesus Christ would come for the first time in a humble way, but he's going to come again a second time when every knee will bow before him, when those who reject him will be humbled. But we need to realise that, yes, a day is coming when those who have not yet bowed the knee to the Saviour will then all be brought before him as their great judge. Well, we start off with that encouragement, that rebuke, that warning of that final verse of the Lord Jesus Christ that we need to stand firm and not be offended by who the Lord Jesus Christ is, but rather receive him and embrace him and all that he stands for. That's how the passage ends, but this passage starts in a very different way in verse 11 where we read of one of the mightiest, one of the greatest miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is still in the region of Galilee. He's not on the shores of the lake, but he's travelling to a city or town called Nain. He's accompanied by a crowd. There are his disciples round about him, but many other people. And you can well imagine that that crowd was a crowd full of joy, people hanging on, the, uh, on every word of the Lord Jesus Christ feeling so privileged to be with the Saviour, wanting to learn of him, wanting to see maybe another miracle that he would do. And yet, as they come to this city, they're about to go into the city, they meet another crowd going in the opposite direction. And the emotional state of that crowd is so different. Unlike the crowd with the Lord Jesus Christ, the crowd coming out of the city of Nain is overwhelmingly sad. They are a crowd full of mourners. They're going to a burial for someone who has just died. And we might say in a sense that those two crowds do picture those who are with Christ and those who are of the world. So it might, at times you might be tempted to think that the world has so much to offer and yet in the final analysis those who are truly blessed are those who are with the Lord Jesus Christ who are one with him and not those who ultimately reap the sadness of sin and this world. Yes, the crowd that's coming out of the town of which we read in verse 12 is on their way to a burial. A death has occurred, and any death is sad. Of course it is. But this death is particularly sad. We read in verse 12, Behold, there was a dead man carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and much people of the city was with her. A man has died, not an old man, not a man who's died of old age, a man who's had many years. No, this is a young man. Not a child, not someone who's died in those early vulnerable years. No, he's successfully come through those years. He's got to the prime of his life and he's been struck down. How sad that is. And then turn your eyes away from the corpse, the dead body, to the family following. And how small that family is. It's just one person, just a widow woman. Yes, she's a widow. Her husband is, has already died and she has just this one son and he has now died. I'm sure that that son was her joy, her hope. In those days, if you didn't have a husband, there was no one to provide for you. Her son would have been her hope, her expectation. And now with his death, her hopes perish and now... They are on the way to bury him. But now let's come to verse 13 and see the kindness of the Lord Jesus. And when the Lord saw her, he had compassion on her. Yes, look at the Lord Jesus Christ. He sees this sad procession and his heart goes out to this widow woman. He has compassion on her. And he does three things. Firstly, he speaks to her. Verse 13, he said unto her, weep not, don't cry. Now if this was just words, empty words to calm her, then there would be no hope at all. But he does more 
then just speak to her. That's the first thing he does. But then secondly, we read in verse 14, he came and touched the bier, that is the couch or the stretcher on which the dead body was lying. And they that bear him stood still. Clearly the people carrying the corpse realised that Lord Jesus Christ is just about to do something or say something. Now, how easy it would have been for the Lord Jesus Christ to keep on walking by. He didn't need to say something. He didn't need to stop. And yet, there was a willingness on his part to be involved in this lady at a time of deepest grief. Isn't it a surprise? He's not afraid to be contaminated. He knows he won't be contaminated by disease or death or sin. In the Old Testament, the Jews wouldn't have anything to do with dead bodies for fear of becoming unclean. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ isn't held back by that. But then the Lord Jesus Christ does something yet more strange. We read again in verse 14, second half of verse 14. And he said, young man, I say unto thee, arise. How strange to speak to a dead body, to speak in a way that everyone knew without any doubt that he was speaking to that dead body. He makes it clear, young man, I say unto thee, arise. Everyone knew who he was speaking to and yet a dead man cannot hear, let alone arise, because he's dead. But the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, yes, they speak of his love and his compassion, but then the action speaks of his power. How kindly those words are, but how empty and false it would be if the Lord Jesus Christ just said words and there was no action to back it up. But the Lord Jesus Christ speaks words with power. He commands that young man to arise and the young man both sits up and begins to speak. Verse 15, and he that was there, dead sat up and began to speak and he, that's the Lord Jesus, delivered him to his mother. He sits up, he speaks, he walks now back to his mother. He is fully, completely restored to life and health. What love on the one hand, what power on the other hand. But notice, before we go any further, where did the initiative come from? Who decided to act? It was Jesus Christ himself. It came from him, his heart, his decision, his initiative. Yes, many, many people came to Jesus, decided to come to Jesus Christ for help and healing. They had heard of him in the past, maybe they'd seen previous miracles they had done, and they thought, maybe he will help me. And yet, in this instance, no one brought this young man to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ was just walking past. Never had he raised someone from the dead. No one came to him expecting him to do this miracle. If he walked past and did nothing, no one would think any less of him. So the desire, desire and the decision to be a blessing comes solely from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But now let's look at the impact that this great miracle has. Verse 16, and there came a fear on all. In other words, there was a great awe, a sense of amazing respect to what had taken place. Well, not surprisingly, this dead man has been brought back, fully restored to life at the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they glorify God. The people praise God. They adore God. And they speak significant words. They say in verse 16 that a great prophet is risen up among us. I would have thought that many of those Jews would have, in their mind's eye, gone back to the Old Testament and thought about those great prophets of old, Elijah and Elisha. 
and we read in the Old Testament how both Elijah and Elisha were both used of God on one occasion, each to raise a dead young man to life again. But then the Jews say something even more significant. They say in the end of verse 16, that God hath visited his people. I wonder what those people meant as they said those words. Maybe some people were saying simply that God, it's clear that God is once more working in a nation. But I think probably there were those who thought yet more deeply and they thought, yes, God is at work, but God is at work in person amongst us. Yes, Jesus Christ worked miracles in profusion, in plenty, in enormous numbers, numbers, and of an amazing nature, completely unseen before. And these great miracles were authenticating signs, signs that proved that he was more than a prophet, but he had come from God himself and was truly God. The, yes, those great miracles were a powerful demonstration of who he is. But then, these miracles have a wider impact. We read of this in verse 17. The rumour of this went forth throughout all Judea. The Lord Jesus Christ is in Galilee. But the news of it goes right down south, down to the region of Judea, and throughout all the region, round about into all the surrounding areas, territories around about Galilee. The news spreads far and wide, and it spreads further. It's carried by the disciples of John the Baptist, to their master, John the Baptist, locked up in prison. And then John sends back two messengers to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he sends them back with this question, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? Are you the one that should come? John is saying, Are you truly the Christ? Or should we be looking for another? Yes, it may well be that John had begun to doubt. And yet now he hears of this great miracle. And hope begins to awaken in the heart of this great servant, John the Baptist, who is languishing, suffering there in prison. And what does the Lord Jesus Christ do in response? We read in verse 21, in that same hour, he, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, cured many of their infirmities, those who are infirm, elderly, weak, and plagues, infectious diseases of all manner of forms and of evil spirits. And unto many that were blind, he gave sight. Yes, a great range of illnesses. The Lord Jesus Christ remarkably restores and then the Lord Jesus Christ gives a message to send back to John the Baptist in prison. Verse 22, then Jesus answering said unto the messengers, go your way and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. To the poor, the gospel is preached. Yes, the Lord Jesus Christ basically sends back a message to John the Baptist saying, yes, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. And what he does basically is refer back to certain prophecies of himself in the great Old Testament prophet Isaiah's book that we find in the Old Testament where we read of many of those prophecies. But the way in which the Lord Jesus Christ speaks and sends that message back to John is saying, yes, I'm fulfilling all those great promises of being the Messiah. But when I fulfill them, I fulfill those promises in a greater way than even the prophecies themselves. Yes, those prophecies mention the blind being made to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, but there's 
certainly nothing in his prophecies of the lepers being cleansed and nothing about the dead being raised to life again. Yes, Jesus Christ in his great miracles provides ample evidence that he is the Christ, the promised one of old, the one who's come from God and in whom all the promises, all the purposes of God are about to be fulfilled. But, did you notice what the Lord Jesus Christ indicates is the greatest thing he does? What is the most powerful miracle? The most amazing thing that the Lord Jesus Christ did as he came into this world? Was it making the blind to see? The deaf to hear? The lame to walk? Maybe curing the leper? Surely though, you might say, it was bringing that dead man back to life. That was an amazing thing. No one was expecting that. Of his own love and compassion, he just spoke the word and restores that man. Just a moment later, he might have been buried and then the Lord Jesus Christ brings him back to life and fully restored. Surely that's the greatest miracle. But no. Look again what the Lord Jesus Christ does in that the, the evidence, list of evidence that he provides to John the Baptist through his messengers and the Lord Jesus Christ builds it up and he says the lepers are cleansed, the deaf are here, the dead are raised. To the poor, the gospel is preached. Jesus Christ is really saying that when he came into the world, his greatest purpose was above all the gospel, to preach the gospel, to provide the gospel. Yes, truly, he worked acts of amazing power. He restored people to health in a way which, which was uncontrovertible. No one could doubt what he had done. It was completely amazing what the Lord Jesus Christ did. And yet his greatest work was the gospel. When he healed someone from their sickness, brought someone back to life again from the dead as he did on at least three occasions. Those people eventually died. But what he came into the world to do above all else was to deal with the root cause of suffering and death and disease. It's the matter of sin and that's what he came to deal with in the gospel. He came to provide the gospel ultimately by giving his life upon the cross of Calvary. He comes to preach the gospel, to point people, men and women and boys and girls to himself as the way back to God, the way whereby we may be pardoned, forgiven, restored and set in the right relationship with the living God. The Lord Jesus Christ provides an eternal blessing, provides a home in heaven and escape from hell. Do we just go to the Lord Jesus Christ for earthly blessings? Do we turn to him in prayer when we're struggling about some major earthly stress? Well, of course that's right, we should go to him with those, those concerns. But if we only go to him for those things, then we miss the great pinnacle for which he came into the world. The greatest work that he came to achieve was the gospel, the salvation from sin. Well, have you sought him? Have you turned to the living God? Have you repented of your sin and believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ? Don't delay on this matter. If you haven't done so, then even this day, even in the next few moments, turn to the Lord yourself, confessing your sins and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ to be your Saviour. He is a God of great compassion. We have no doubt about that in the passage which we have read, and he is more than willing to forgive each one who comes to him sincerely, asking for that pardon and forgiveness for our, for our sins. Now let's all pray. O oh Lord God, our loving Father in heaven, we bless and praise thee for what Christ did when here upon the earth those mighty deeds of power, but we thank thee that most of all he has provided the gospel for the salvation of our souls, we pray, Lord God, that not one of us would be ashamed of him, but might truly receive him, believe upon him, embrace him in our hearts, 
turn to him as their rightful Lord and Saviour. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's turn to our final hymn this morning. Our final hymn this morning is number 70. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus, trusting only thee. Number 70. Great joy gathering with each one of you this morning for our morning time of worship. But let's now commit to all that we've been able to do this morning to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, our Father, we thank and bless thee for this time we've had around thy word, this time to worship the living God. Bless all that has taken place. Forgive all that thou hast seen amiss. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>